Okay, hello, welcome back. Let's uh, continue onward. Um, in the last lectures, we covered light, some of the basic physical properties, the propagation of light, and then got into optical systems. I explained various kinds of uh, lenses and what happens to objects at various distances, explained real images and virtual images, and then we explained the eyes. Um, ability to form images on the retina using its um, lens to change the diopter of the eye and so I gave you several cases of that and um, I want to now explain what it looks like when in a head mounted display you have a screen placed in front of the eye with a convex lens in between. So, this is a very common situation and this is what you have in the lab. So, if we take the eye again I am drawing the same kind of pictures like I did last time. So, the retina is in the back here I have the lens of the eye here. Suppose we have light coming in through parallel rays and then it focuses on the on the retina in this particular example at the place called the fovea which is the place of highest uh, visual acuity which is something that we will cover today. Um, as we go along today I will be explaining um, human vision the biology of it some of the neuroscience some of the particular components that we have um, trying to get you to understand um, how visual perception happens in our brains. So, I want you to get a, a, an understanding of that because that is a critical part of engineering of VR systems overall. All right. So, we have this and then I have a display let us say here. So, this is a visual display. If you put a display very close to your eyes can you focus on it? Right. So, if it is very very close you will not be able to focus because if you remember from last time um, if you consider each one of these pixels as a point source of light the rays are going to be very much diverged right. So, and remember the diopter will tell you um, if you have parallel rays how far um, it will take before they converge back um, from, from the parallel case if they are diverged it will take a very very powerful lens to do that. The lens in your eye can compensate for some of that but not all of it. So, if I take a, um, a very weak lens so, I just brought a, a weak convex lens with me today and if I want to go up and try to focus on some particular part on the board I have to stop the lens about if I put it you know very close to my eye and see how close I can get I, I have to stop about right here. Um, I tried with some students in, in the class a little bit b before the class started and they could get it up quite a bit closer because they are using this lens to further converge the rays they are using their eye muscles to further converge. I have lost about 30 percent of my ability to do that. So, I have to hold it back and maybe in a year or two I will have to hold it even further back. So, so what is going to work for me a more powerful lens right. So, it is going to do all of the work that this lens used to do when I was younger and more. So, that it will work for everyone. Um, at least everyone who is able to focus on light coming in at uh, in parallel rays and focus it onto the retina. Um, you could adjust some lens that you put in between back and forth to cover different cases of nearsightedness and farsightedness, but what you cannot easily compensate for is astigmatism which is one of the lens aberrations that we talked about last time and the human eye is subject to astigmatisms the um, the eye becomes um, ellipsoidal in shape in some way and then the focusing becomes asymmetric. So, if you remember there is a horizontal focal plane and a vertical focal plane for example and they are not the same when there is an astigmatism, but you can at least by adjusting the lens location have some range of diopters um, which makes it compatible for a, a very large range of people. So, I put a lens in the middle here. and I did not bring a powerful enough lens to really illustrate being able to go very close. You need a powerful if you um if you go out and buy a, a very powerful magnifying lens um it will be ex it should be exactly right for this and you can do the experiment yourself. <coughs> so, this comes out of the lens, but the point I may be looking at here the pixel that I may be looking at has very divergent rays 
if I draw this right here, maybe very divergent rays, but then they bend through the lens and come out uh, parallel. Not quite drawing that right, but um, the lens should be taking these divergent rays and making them come out parallel. <clears throat> if they come out converging, then you have a problem, right? They may come out converging and then no matter what you do with your lens you will you will see blur because they are converging short of the retina. So, you got to be careful with that. If you go the other way if they are still diverging a little bit maybe your eye can compensate All right. So, that is that is the how depending on your ability to change your lens All right. Questions about that? So, the um the retina is this part all the way around the back here. I am going to go into the details of the retina and the neurons that are very close to it and then I will eventually cover the visual pathways that we as, as the signals go all the way back into the visual cortex which is back here um, under your skull. All right. So, placed along the retina are what are called photoreceptors. The photoreceptors let me write it out photoreceptors I like to think of these as the input pixels right if we think of engineering terminology. So, the display has its pixels on it right RGB pixels there are essentially input pixels on the retina whereas the display is producing the output pixels and there is some kind of interface going on here that involves a significant amount of optics right. The eyes lens the um the cornea remember is doing the most amount of light bending and uh the, the, the engineered lens as well. So, all of this comes together there are uh two kinds of photoreceptors you may have seen this before uh rods and cones. Um, regarding rods, we have about 120 million per eye. So, and for cones, we have far fewer, only about six million. And um, the function of these different types. considerably different rods are for uh, low light low light intensity and the cones are for color sensitivity this separation of different types of photoreceptors has a profound impact on the way that we perceive um brightness levels color all sorts of things um as we process visual information and we get to the perception of vision this fundamental separation. So, you may have noticed that um if you are outside at night you are getting uh you are in a low light setting you cannot distinguish colors very well right. So, so it's one of the fundamental outcomes of this. So, let me show you a picture of how these rods and cones are distributed around the retina right. And notice that you know when the light comes in from say the bottom here it hits this part of the retina right up at the top and when the light comes in from the top it hits the bottom part of the retina. So, in some sense the image is upside down right why do not I look upside down to you right now right the image on your retina is upside down. Yeah. So, I mean you you have been your, your brain has learned to accept that right during your entire lifetime. So, it is considered normal there is no such transformation that has to be applied to it. There is not like a uh, some neurons that go and flip the image do not think so it is just what you have learned. Um, you may have heard of experiments where people put on prism glasses that invert the images and then after some number of days or weeks um they do not see the inversion anymore everything looks fine again. So, your brain can learn the orientation as as being correct and it does not matter that this is upside down or right side up. It is not like there is a special piece of hardware that you have that is devoted to 
um, inverting it and and, um, and and correcting it because it, in some sense it's it's consistent with what you've had your entire life. All right. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, let me show the picture. That's what I was going to do. So this shows the um, the number of um, receptors per square millimeter and uh, 0 is right at the fovea and that is the place where you have the greatest concentration of uh, cones and then as you get a degree or two off from that the cones start to get replaced by rods and then the rod density increases and until you get um, about 15 degrees away or so to either side except for the strange anomaly over here between 10 and 20 degrees which is the blind spot um, on the retina. And the reason why the blind spot is there is because of the connection to the optic nerve which I will show the geometry of in just a little bit. So, for these different types of photoreceptors that we have the um, the rods are res responsive to light across these wavelengths shown in the dashed line here. So, centered at let us say 498 and um, um, of course, they will respond to an area around that, but with let us say lower and lower probability for an equivalent um, intensity of stimulus. And then there are for the cones three different kinds and this this amazes me it is it is a uh, RGB just like the way we design our monitors. So, um, and displays. So, we have a uh, we have red cones, um, green cones and blue cones distributed around in some kind of irregular way along the retina. So, let me just draw a little bit here of a picture as well. So, in the um, in the fovea at 0 degrees it is all cones and they are very densely packed I am not drawing them as different colors, but there is also some kind of irregular arrangement of of colors. So, these are quite small they are um, their diameter is between 1 to 4 micrometers in diameter. What I think is interesting about that is that um, if we think about wavelengths of visible light. So, let me, um, let me put that squeeze that up here wavelengths of visible light. what did I say it is between a 400 and 700 nanometers last time, but let us convert it to micrometers. So, it is 0 0.4 micrometers to 0 0.7 micrometers. So, using uh, 10 to the minus 6th units instead of 10 to the minus 9th units and if we do that then we see that at the very center of the fovea these things th these these um, cones pack in to the size of 1 micrometer which is not very much larger than the wavelength of visible light which I find really incredible. So, if you tried to make these any smaller you would start to get very difficult kinds of interferences right with, with, with the waves I mean they would be much smaller than the actual wavelengths and um, would not operate so well. So, so this seems to be about as small as you can make this and still have it function well which I think is uh, quite amazing that you know the density of these again are down to roughly the, the, the size of the wavelengths of visible light. So, quite small. Um, so, these are as I said at 0 it is all cones already when you get over to 2 degrees off two degrees off then you are leaving the fovea what happens there is the cones already are getting bigger and rods start appearing among them. So, the cones are in the 4 micrometer to 10 micrometer range whereas the rods are um, down to 1 micrometer. So, they are small like the cones were and um, the cones are now getting larger and uh, loosely 
interspersed with a lot of tightly packed rods. And then by the time we get all the way over to 50 degrees, it's almost entirely rods. A few, let's draw a couple of cones in there. Um, so that suggests that when we're looking we look forward when the fovea is fixated we have a very high um, visual acuity in color and then as we look off to the side without rotating the eye right we look off to the side so that the image is over to the side of the retina towards the top or bottom from my horizontal picture as I look to the side right. So, if we we're, if we are looking over to the side without rotating the eye it is over here then we start losing um spatial resolution in terms of color eventually the whole thing tapers off as I showed in this picture here eventually when we get 60 or 70 degrees away you can see that um, the density is going down significantly. So, you end up losing eventually everything right, but certainly your ability to distinguish colors out here is very weak. If you, if you believe you can see colors there it is because your brain is filling in information that is not there right trying to speculate let us say. Right, questions about this? <clears throat>